Excellent. Well, good morning, uh, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome at uh, this um, this second webinar in a series about um, sustainable growth. Today, um, we're welcoming uh, James Bagan, uh, operating partner over at Frog Capital. I'll give him a couple of minutes to introduce himself in a sec. Um, I'm uh, I'm here together with uh, Roe Hartov for uh, for those who were at the uh, first webinar. Um, one of our revenue architects um, and an expert, if I may say so, uh, on um, on um, scalable, predictable, and sustainable growth. Um, and uh, together, we will be asking James uh, a set of questions around, um, you know, from his perspective, from an operational perspective, from a VC perspective, um, what does sustainable growth mean, and and how do you operationalize that? Um, that's probably going to take about thirty to forty minutes, and then uh, we want to open it up to you guys to give you the opportunity to ask James any questions that you might have. Um, uh, I think that's it, yeah. So so James, um, for those who don't know you yet, um, can you introduce yourself in a couple of sentences? In a couple of sentences. So um, I, uh, my, yeah, my name's James Bagan. I'm uh, an operating partner at Frog Capital. I'm a senior advisor at uh, PSG Equity, and I chair a number of um, uh, B2B European, tech scale-ups. Um, and uh, in terms of the career narrative, I, I took my first uh, sales role in, um, in 1992. So I've actually been doing this for 30 years. Um, and uh, I had a pretty conventional sales career to start off with, um, finishing up Experian. But, but from 2004 onwards, I was very lucky to, uh, to, to have uh, run and sold a couple of private equity-backed businesses. And after I sold my second business in 2012, I became a um, sales and marketing operating partner for Living Bridge, who are a mid-market private equity player. Since then, um, I've been running my own sales advisory business for investors. Um, and uh, I'm appearing today in my capacity as sales operating partner for Frog Capital, who uh, I think that name um, will come up a couple of times, I'm sure, through the course of, uh, of today's webinar. Thanks, uh, James. And um, and before we dive into sustainable growth, can you, because I realized when we were talking or when I talk with other VCs, the, the concept of an operating partner is some kind of a luxury. Not that every VC or every PE works with operating partners. So for those who are unfamiliar with the, the concept of an operating partner, could you explain to us quickly what uh, what that is? Yeah, I will. And, and you're absolutely right, by the way. It does mean different things to different investors. Um, so, so some are a little more passive or arm's length, some are more active, uh, actively engaged. I think the frog model actually um, is the one that works best for me. Um, and I think also for, for the investments. Uh, in principle, my job is to help the investment directors at... Um, uh, uh, Actually, I'll put it this way. I, I have two primary responsibilities. The first one is to help the, the investment directors at, at, at Frog Capital make better decisions about the businesses they can invest in. So when they're looking at a, a potential investment, my job uh, alongside my fellow operating partners is to uh, conduct an objective appraisal of the commercial capability of, the, of, of, of that business, of that, of that investment. The second part of my role is once that business is in the portfolio, I'm a fully funded resource. So fr Frog, Frog, pay for me not not the business uh, and my job is to build relationships with the CEOs and their management teams to find and fix any kind of commercial issue across um, uh, across their business and sort of conflating all of this into one part um, and how that works with winning by design is is you know if I go in and see a business and we have a let's just say a, a general point Jeremy we've got a, a gap around skills or conversion execution or, or, or sales training um, I will then uh, work with the business to help uh, uh, scope a, a winning by design engagement so that you guys can come in and um, and deliver the value that that investment may need. Excellent. Thanks. And, and you know, um, having worked with you and, and having seen firsthand the, impact, the impact of an operating partner, I think it's I think it's great, uh, the concept of an operating partner, because, you know, you've seen it. Uh, you've lived it, and for many of these people, it's the first time, right? And uh, and having that uh, external perspective um, is often very helpful. So, um, no, I think that's great. Well, I actually had it as a CEO. So when I was a CEO, when I was selling my business, I had I had advisors coming in, and right. I think that the thing that I struggled with. We're talking a little while ago now, Jeremy, but those guys were, and I'm not being disparaging here, but they tended to be management consultants. 
So um, that's fine. And you can add some value. I'm not suggesting that you can't. But what I really, really needed was I needed somebody who'd been there and done it before. I needed somebody right. who'd been in that seat in the role that I'd been in, made a ton of mistakes, done it well too, but was able to offer practical advice, suggestions, solutions, ideas, whatever it may be. And I think that's that's the real um, benefit if you get the right operating advisor in your in your business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So sustainable growth, right? It's been it's been a topic at our previous webinar. I think it's something that I at least I, I see it passing by online increasingly. Um, but from your perspective um, as an operating partner, for what does sustainable growth? What does that exactly mean? Um, well, I, I think I, actually it, it doesn't exactly mean um, anything. Uh, I, I think there is a, a, a degree of su subjectivity here. I think I think the the commonest um definition would be the one around um you, you know an ability uh, the, the the ability of a business to grow um to grow its, its revenues to increase its revenues um without additional finance that that in, in my world jeremy that's what it would mean is that that you're not having to continue to uh, to burn cash or, or burn someone else's money to to grow over time so so it, in in three words to be commercially self-sustainable right that I think that I think would be the commonest uh, explanation. If I may, just for thirty seconds, at Frog though it, it actually also and, and other investors, I should say this at Frog, it means something something else on top of that, which is about uh, businesses that that can make a positive difference to society. So if you look at the Frog website, and I encourage you to do so, you'll see sustainability, you'll see purpose, you'll see positive growth littered across all of their messaging because it's something they they truly believe in. So building, creating, thriving organisations organizations that will will stand the test of time right so there's that sustainability piece in terms of um, um commercial uh, growth without additional finance and i think there's a a slightly subtler meaning which is around um positive intent and and uh long-term um uh long-term thriving organizations resilient right. organizations <laughs> It's funny that you bring up that website. Ro and I were in preparation of this uh, webinar. We were on the Frog website, and and something that we saw was actually there's quite a lot of content out there around sustainability. Has has sustainability always been so important for Frog? Well, I'm I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to say that it has. Um, I'm not I'm not going to pretend that it, it isn't a topic that hasn't come up more recently because it absolutely has. That there's no question, and not just at Frog. It's 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 in it's within other investors and other businesses that I work across, for very very obvious reasons, and I'll I'll talk about those in a moment. But I'm 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 delighted to say um, I think Frog from the get go is a, a twelve year old business with a couple of funds in there now. They um, they have never been Jeremy. They've never been one of those growth at all costs investors. Um, I've certainly never felt that pressure as an operating advisor or one of their chairs, and I don't think their CEOs have either. Um, the the, 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 the scale-up methodology, and again, I won't go on about this too much here, but if you have a look at it on the website, it has three component elements to it. Uh, planning and execution are two, but the other one is sustainability, and it's been sustainability from year dot. It's been, it's been that way uh, since they started. Um, however, things have clearly changed. Um, current macroeconomic conditions are, shall we say, unfavourable, um, and, and therefore um, the Frog team have, have doubled down on uh, on helping their management teams accelerate profitability progress, which I think we'll probably talk about today, and just make sure that businesses are properly properly capitalised. You know, their balance sheets are in good order. Mm -hmm. James, does that mean? Coming back to how you define sustainable growth, does that mean that for early stage companies, that term is not relevant? Because when you're an early stage uh, startup and you want to go through uh, into the VC um, to get VC funding, you, you choose that route. You expect to have, I don't know, three, four, five uh, funding rounds until you can actually reach that profitability, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about sustainable growth, how how is how is that relevant for early stage companies? So I, I fully accept, Roy, that, that that early stage businesses will be burning cash, um, and uh, I fully accept that um, you know pulling a number out of the air, maybe you know up to two mil ARR, you, you are you are still going to be. Um, 
um, spending more money than you're making. Let's 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 keep it nice and simple for uh, for now. Um, but I, I I would absolutely contend that that any founder, any CEO who's going into uh, even if it's an early stage round, I think you have to be able to articulate what what investors would call a path to profitability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that 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 that's a question that we always ask. And again, it's not it's not um, unique to Frog. Most investors would, would sit down with management teams in early stage businesses and say, OK, explain to me how you're going to ultimately, eventually uh, make a return here. I guess the thing is that uh, and again, this is a, per a personal comment here. Let me just put a rider on this, a personal perspective. I just don't know how how seriously that question was asked in the past. And I don't know how rigorously it was tested. So, you know, we would say to CEOs and founders, you know, how, how would you how would you describe this path to profitability? How are you going to make it? Um, and uh, there would be a nod to it. There would be a comment on it. There'd be a, there may even be a slide in the deck on it. But I, I never yeah. really felt that it was substantive. My goodness me, it's totally changed. You know, not only do you have to be able to... Um, uh, demonstrate that you fully understand the criticality of uh, at a point moving to profitability or to break even. You have to be able to explain how and when, because the the very very smart investors that I work with will be will be testing that. Uh, we're testing your plan. Um, uh, th there's no doubt now. You know, that it, it's just changed and it's changed dramatically quickly. So my point here, I think, is that it was always important, right? Always important. Uh, but I, it, it's 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 gone up the um, it, it's absolutely gone up the agenda now, and it's become something that is 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 really really critical for investors. I, I think the biggest evidence that it, you know this question has been brought up, but nobody took it seriously, is that you have public companies that already did IPOs, and they still don't have a clear way to reach profitability, right? We, we saw the example of a company that was just bought last week, right? That they have they have a path, but nobody they're not even close to getting profitability to get profitability and and a lot of other companies that did did IPOs in the past two years, but they're not even close. They don't even know how to get to profitability. So I think I think as investors, we have to take we have to take part of the blame here. Because I think that the the era of high multiples and cheap cheap money um, may be coming to an end. Certainly, the high multiples is uh, that the evidence is clear. SaaS multiples are down seventy five percent in just uh, just a year, according to Bessemer. So, the evidence is there. Um, but I think we're partly to blame because I think because we've been putting in pumping in so much money into into the go to market um, engines in our businesses. Um, whether it's been said out loud or whether it's been an inference, CEOs have been hearing, we just need to grow at all cost. Um, and, and haven't been cognizant of the fact that at some point you're going to have to get this back under control and move to, to what we're talking about today, sustainable growth. I, I, heard a, I heard a stat, please don't fact check me on this because it was secondhand, but I heard a stat the other day that um, of the, the 95 IPOs in the States last year, four are trading at value or higher so i think i think you're right that, 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 that a lot of people simply don't um don't understand how important this is and then also what what, what they need to do about it one of the businesses in germany that, that i work on with your guys um just just a nod to to my my fellow investor here paul, paul davidson at o octopus ventures he, he's been saying for for a long time now a long time middle of, of last year that the cash burn multiple is going to become much, much more important for investors and therefore businesses, perhaps more important than the, the, the sort of the classic um, VC SaaS stat of, of um, CAT to LTV ratio. Um, the, 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 so ca cash burn multiple basically talks about how um, every, every marketing dollar that you spend, you know, what are you, what are you actually, how does that compare to what you're burning? Um, and what, what we're looking for there is equalization. We're looking for every 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 pound, euro, dollar that you you burn, you, you need to be bringing in the same in net new incremental ARR. I have to tell you, I think most of the businesses that, that I've come across over the last couple of years are nowhere near that. We're seeing ratios yeah. of one to four, one to five, one to six. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a really, 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 really tough situation because people are having to feel they're having to pivot 
overnight from this high growth at all costs to, wow, um, we, we've got to be sustainable. We've got to have a path to profitability. Really tough. So we talked about this this path uh, to um, uh, profitability. Oh, and uh, 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 thanks for the way for this. Uh, so love to hear from the people here um, on the call where in which stage of growth you uh, your the organization that you currently work for is, so that we can then navigate the conversation to uh, to be more relevant for all of you. See startups, scale ups, predominantly no grown ups. Yeah, I don't know if everybody can see that. Now I'm sharing this. Uh... There you go. Okay. So 55% is working at a startup and 45% at a, at a scale up. So we don't have, uh, we don't have people's, uh, people here just yet preparing for IPOs. We've got no grown ups on the call. That, that's yeah. <laughs> that sounds right. So um, I think what is really interesting uh, is that that road to profitability that you talked about and, um, and, and the importance of that, right? Um, but other than that, right? Like, how um, how do you foresee that um, sustainability ties into the day to day of um, of the people here on the call, right? Uh, well, I, I think as I've already mentioned, I, th I think the very first thing that I would say I, I, this isn't particularly helpful, but but might build some empathy. It it, it is super hard. That there are there are no easy answers here. Um, the, I mean, if you're if you're on the leadership team of an investor backed business and you and you have been throughout this period, um, almost inevitably you will have had to confront this new reality because you'll have you'll have investors on your board who will start um, who have been starting to talk about this in 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 entirely different ways. Um, most of the businesses that I work with don't have. Uh, you know, huge sort of real estate asset, if you like, that the, the levers that they've got in terms of managing their business tend, tend, to, tend to be just two, it just tends to be costs and revenue. Uh, and, and we'll come on to revenue in a minute, but on, on the cost side, it, it could be something simple. It could be, um, it could be that you're not, you're not allowed, uh, you're not allowed to, to, to replace levers. Um, uh, it, it could be that, you know, your CTO has got a, um, you know, a high ticket development project, and it simply has to be parked uh, or, or, or even cancelled. Um, so, uh, and it could, it could even be a lot worse than that. Let, let's be honest. Let's be honest. There are some businesses out there. If we go back to the the cash burn concept, that are simply are simply spending too much uh, of other people's money, and so they may actually have to reduce costs. I'm sure all of us have seen examples of. Uh, of businesses that have had to uh, dramatically reduce their headcount just to survive. This isn't about this isn't about public businesses making sure that dividends are paid or, or CEOs are getting their bonuses. This is about scale ups and startups um, being deprived of cash of oxygen. They're, ha they're having to cut costs just to just to continue to exist. So some really really tough really tough decisions which which um, uh, I'm very aware of. But obviously the other lever is is revenue. Um, and I think there's a number of I think there's a number of different things we can do, Jeremy. And I think this, this is one of the reasons why I really enjoy working with um, with you guys is because we're, we're, we're quite closely aligned on some of these things. So just off the top of my head, um, I, 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 I would have said this in the last recession that, that I, I worked through, which was or let's say the last recession, but the last financial crisis in 2007, 8. Um, absolutely focusing on your customers, I think, is a is a critical part of it. There's a wealth of studies on uh, available that would support the contention that um, delivering delivering a, a euro revenue from your your existing customers is 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 not only quicker but it's much more efficient than it would be from winning a new logo. So I think making sure that the um, expansion strategies that you have within your business are are, are solid. Uh, I think also if you have the ability to sell to enterprise or public sector. That's something I would definitely focus down on. Public sector organisations tend to, budgets tend to re remain relatively, I would say this, relatively immune through financial crisis. They may change when it comes to the next cycle, but they, they do tend to deploy their monies as they said they would at the start of the year. Enterprise as well with strong balance sheets will be a little bit more robust. Also, I think they present an opportunity for you to be a little cuter with your pricing strategy. So that may there may actually be opportunities for you to increase your prices to some parts of your, your marketplaces through a through a financial crisis. 
Um, and then finally, my, my final point here would just be um, focusing on quality and not quantity. Um, just, just tweaking up individual conversion rates from stage to stage, stage to stage will have a, a huge cumulative impact across your, um, your revenue capability. So, uh, and again, I think these are all things, about, sort of bouncing it back to you, I think these are all things that you guys would, would agree with at Winning by Design, no? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. sorry, you're away. Please go ahead. One of the points that you said, like uh, focusing on customers, uh, Jeremy and I had a call last week with one of our clients that we're advising. Um, and we were like, all right, so you're, you're the head of sales and, and you're probably now thinking of 2023. What are your goals? And he was like, I don't know if it's going to be 30 or 40. And then we were like, that's great. How much of this comes from existing customers and how much is new business? And he didn't have the answer. And it was like, we told him, it doesn't matter if it's 30 or 40, like how you build this and how much you focus on your existing customers. That's the real question. That's where you really need to ask yourself. Uh, so it, yeah, for me, it was striking. You didn't even think about uh, expansion or anything like that. He was he was yeah. coming from it solely from a new business perspective. Yeah. And, uh, and I just go go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. No. To your other point, I think I think what really resonates with us uh, or or with me particularly is is trying you know trying to reshift your focus rather than in growing and and hiring new people and scaling. Try to refocus on you know what you already have in place and like you said. Uh, uh, these kind of like marginal gains throughout the process will have compounding impact, um, which can be it, it can be a significant growth lever as well. And uh, and and all that you need for that is probably in house, publicly available on the web. Uh, so it's it's not an it's not an exercise that is going to cost you years, thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of euros. Nothing like that. It's something that you can fairly simply undertake yourself. So uh, that really resonates. Um, that really resonates as well. There's a there's a really. I know you guys provide all of your stuff open source, which I think again is one of the really attractive um, parts to the winning by design proposition. But um, there's there's a, a study, and again, I, if you guys can find it, um, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but it was released recently by Bain Bain Capital, and uh, absolutely looking at customer success and customer retention. They talk about. Um, a, a just a five percent increase in your customer retention rate uh, in a software business, to be clear, can increase um, overall corporate profitability by over fifty percent. In some instances, by seventy-five percent. The the return is 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 literally exponential. Uh, also, a, a, another fascinating stat I saw as well from from the same study was 70% um, of the customers who described themselves as satisfied, i.e., you know, we're pretty happy with what we bought from you, never proactively go back to the vendor and ask to do more business. Mm. Which, I mean, you know, if, if I was a salesperson, that's where I'd be making my calls. You know, that's where yeah. I would be focusing my activity because surely the, the route to revenue is going to be much more straightforward with that existing relationship or where you're already on the procurement um, uh, roster or whatever it might be. So there is latent potential clearly in your, in your, in your customer success. Um, do you know, it's, it's funny, when I, when I started out 30 years ago, the account managers as they were then, it was, it was very much looked down on. As a new business sales guy, we didn't really see it as, as real sales. We were really condescending and patronizing about it. I'm I'm so pleased the advent of SaaS has changed that, because 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 of the the pricing model, because of this this um, subscription model, most of the margin, most of the profit you'll make on a SaaS deal will be in subsequent years. You guys use you guys use a lovely phrase which which it, I, I, I I thought it was great the very first time I heard it and and I use it I probably use it every day but it's this kind of recurring revenue needs recurring impact and it it it's sort of facilitated by your bow tie sort of inverted funnel which i love and that's just making sure that um, you're thinking about customer success from from day one of the of the sales process um, and it's great it's great to see that customer success is, has become a, um, a critical part of any go-to-market strategy now even more so in a downturn i want to bring up uh, andrew's comment here um, and it's going to be a tough one for you james let's see how you handle this 
So there's the uh, Andrew. You want to come off mute, mute and turn that into a co a, a question because that's an interesting point you raised. Yeah, we're all, we're all um, under pressure when employees are expecting and seeing ten percent inflation. Therefore, they get a ten percent pay rise just as a default, right? So how how are we all dealing with that? Um, and it is a challenge, of course, when James you, you commented on managing costs. So I sort of piggybacked it on the back of that as a challenge. Um, so it is an issue. Uh, what we've done just as a for the record, people could have different uh, ways of dealing with it. We decided that everybody under 35K salary will get a 500 pound cost of living bonus as a one-off. And then uh, and then our end of year review, um, we'll do people's end of year reviews and they'll either get naught, two and a half, five or seven and a half percent pay increase, depending on that. And we'll, we'd expect a bell curve on, on that. So. It's just how we've decided to handle it. We haven't done it yet. We don't know what the reaction is, uh, but it's a difficult one to deal with, of course, since me uh, pointing out. There's absolutely no doubt that that's the case. And again, I, 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 would, I would put this, this problem in the hard bucket. I, I don't have any easy answers here. Um, I, um, I think with the, the, um, the, lo the lockdown, the lockdowns that we had last year precipitated this sort of great resignation, which you guys may have turned about. We, we saw staff churn, staff turnover rates across our portfolio at incredible levels. Um, and part of that was fueled by some, some very well-funded um, tech businesses. And part of it now obviously being funded by the energy crisis, the supply and trade crisis. I think um, US inflation is at a 40 year high, I think. Uh, I think it's something like that. I mean, these are unprecedented numbers. Um, um, just two or three points on your on your mortgage rate can be can be crippling on a monthly basis. Uh, I lost I lost a CRO Andrew earlier this year to a very well known CRM business in in uh, in California, um, and they 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 offered him um, forty thousand euros on his basic salary. So you go into that conversation thinking, right, I'm going to start, you know, a, a negotiation. How can I persuade this individual to leave? You know, we, we've got the ping pong table. We've got the free coffee. Uh, we've got the bean bags. I'm sorry. At the end, at the end of the day, what you've got to do is just stand up, shake the guy's hand and wish him all the best. There, there, there are going to be there are going to be instances here that you just simply can't win. I love I love the ideas that you come up with where you're helping your staff to just navigate what is an enormously difficult period and probably probably going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. But there are no easy answers here, I'm afraid. Um, it is it is a really, really difficult situation. You're right. Be interested if anyone else has done anything similar and what whether they've got any post implementation reaction. All right, uh, James, here, here's another uh, question for you. So you talked about um, market cap in, in the private in the public markets, the market cap of companies uh, dramatically uh, went down. Mm. How does that affect VC backed early stage SaaS companies? uh oh uh, it, it has it has uh it has a dramatic effect it, it may be a little bit subtle though so you, people don't don't feel it straight away um but it absolutely does uh because the 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 public markets are basically the barometer for valuations you know so um uh it, it will you know we're, we're looking we're looking in and again please please feel free to fact check me on this because i, I don't have the the provenance of the data to ham, but I think public company multiples in circuit certain sectors are down by like eighty percent. So if you if you if you if you accept then that these markets will represent exit valuations, then if you think about your business, your business that was valued a year ago, you turn that number on its head, it could be then that your business is valued at a fifth of what it was last year. Um, you know when I when I when I first when I first saw that, um, I, I really it really did sort of. Uh, stop me in my tracks and, I, and I've actually seen that by the way Roy I've actually seen that myself in some of the businesses that I was talking to earlier this year and then, I mean, I'm talking in 2022 I'm not talking about 21 in 2022 talking to businesses that were getting pre-money valuations of 15x I even heard one at 20x um, and again similar to the exchanges with Andrew you were a little bit like okay well look guys that's a life-changing sum of money you, you know, the second reason that you guys should take the money and, and the very best of luck to you. Unfortunately, timing didn't work in their favor. The deal didn't get completed in time. 
um, and uh, I'm hearing they actually completed the round at 5x. And I actually, yeah. right now, that's pretty generous. So, so yes, that public market piece, it, you may, it may, you may feel removed from it somewhat, but it absolutely will have an effect on 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 the world in which everybody on this call lives day in day out. The, the, the way I imagine it is, your your investor team, when they get the pitch and they were like, what they think they're worth like 15, 10x, whatever it is right now, it's like, guys, you need to come back to earth. Like it's not going to happen. So I think in practice, uh, you know, Whitting by Design, we're not a strategy uh, consulting company, but it's one of those things that that when I do talk to, to, to those leaderships, um, friends mostly, it's like, hey guys, go back, revisit your uh, five-year plan because the valuation, your growth, uh, the money that you expected to raise, uh, everything has changed dramatically. So you guys need to revisit that. It's like you can, you won't be able to hire that uh, round B or round C with with the, with what you expected to get. It's like everything needs to change. People are modest there, so that's that's my personal take on it. Yeah, and I and I uh, uh, again, this is I, I'm not in a position to be offering investment investment advice, but but you know, uh, uh, um, informally, I'd be saying to people, this isn't the time. You know, th this isn't this isn't the time. If you were thinking about, um, I'm not saying you can't raise money, and I'm not saying that you can't exit a business. I'm doing both of those things right now. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, if I was a CEO again and I was I was running a business, I, I'd be thinking much more about doubling down into 23. Uh, I really, really hope I'm wrong about this, but I feel that whatever this is, um, whatever's going on at the moment, I, I feel it's actually going to get a bit worse. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, actually, uh, you know, just just so everyone's aware, I'm I'm in I'm in the UK, and we, we've got, um, and I don't want to be disparaging about about the, the the country because actually I think that's that's self fulfilling, but we've got a perfect storm here of different things. You know, we've got the the, the end of the pandemic is the end of the pandemic. Um, the uh, inflationary uh, issues that Andrew's raised and, and are having to on the, the energy crisis, the war in Ukraine. And also, I think Brexit has, has had some effects. There's no doubt about it. Certainly in the world that I exist in, Brexit has had, has had some effects. So, um, you know, we've, we've all, we're all dealing with um, a whole number of, uh, uh, let's be honest, um, negative uh, headwinds. And, and for salespeople, what I'm seeing uh, practically day to day is that deals that would have got uh, signed off speedily in the past, you know, low value deals that you, you just would expect to turn around quite quickly, just aren't happening. C CFOs seem to me to be getting senior, seem to be getting involved in, in small value deals in a way in which they, they just weren't even a year ago. Um, every single every single pound or dollar or euro that's going out of the business is subject to um, a significant review, and uh, and so again, I think the challenge sort of back for us as salespeople is is being extremely compelling around the value that we're delivering, which which has always been the case. It's always been the case. I think that's absolutely our obligation, but I think the it, 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 the, the lens that's being applied now by by buyers um, is greater than than it was a year ago. One of the questions that that we prepared for you was like, what do you, what would you recommend, or how would you prepare your uh, portfolio companies for the next funding round? But you already mentioned that, right? I just wouldn't. I just yeah. wouldn't. I mean, I, I mean, you know what? I, 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 I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how you will get. Um, I don't know how you will, you you can achieve the, the valuation that you you really deserve when when the market is so down i mean i i'm no economist um but that 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 that's obvious to me i think um and so no i i think there are exceptional circumstances as i said i, I am involved in a, in a couple of exit processes i think these are that there are um um corollary factors here though one of them is in an incredibly juicy market, which actually is a market that is, I wouldn't call it recession proof, but actually in the downturn, it's one of those markets that actually builds and grows. There, there are some out there. Um, and so um, inbound interest on acquisition for that particular business is super high. Um, 
I, 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 I just think though, as a, and I'm making a massive generalization here, which I fully accept, but I think I, I will go back to what I said a couple of minutes ago. I, I would be saying to people really, really now, it, I think I'd be looking inwards. I'd be focusing on, on making sure my business was in great shape. I would be making sure that I had a, what we call a fume date or a cash burnout date. So when you run out of cash, basically, I'd be looking to make sure that was, that was into 2024. So again, talking plainly, making sure that you've got enough cash to run your business for another year at least. Um, uh, if, if, things, if things start to turn in the second half of the year, you know, I reserve the right to, to change my mind on that. But I would be, I would be saying that fundraising delayed into 24 would be my, my general comment here. All right. So, so we talked about that. It's, it's not time to fundraise. We talked about the need to reduce costs, right, to extend the runway. Um, but the upside, and you started to talk about this, is like, how can we still generate revenue and re generate growth, right, with what we have in our hands? What's without going into details, right? And and what's the best practices there? Well, I think I think we talked about a bit of it already. I think um, focusing on 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 quality, not quantity. So making sure that we your sales execution stage by stage is is, is, is optimized across products, regions, and individuals. Um, and I think um, that's where you guys can help. I think that's where the sort of coaching capability for the sales managers, sales leadership can, can make a difference. I think focusing on enterprise and public sector, I think also makes, self, makes sense. And I think also um, um, looking uh, inwards onto your existing customers and, and um, making sure that they're happy, but also that, that your expansion strategies are, are solid. Um, uh, I think also, uh, and again, um, one of the one of the reasons I think that that Frog and, and Winning by Design also like like to work together is is um, the obsession around data and the importance of data and the criticality of data uh, in making more sort of scientifically led decisions. Um, I, I've always loved how you guys have 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 gone about that because it um, we we try and emulate it at Frog. We don't we don't quite do it. In the same way as you do, but but the principle is the same. Um, and actually, I think uh, uh, investors. I mean, if you think about it, investors tend to be, you know, chartered accountants or investment bankers by trade. So they're always they're always going to sort of naturally gravitate towards the spreadsheet anyway. They're always going to want to have evidential based decisioning, which which is um, which I think is right. I don't think you should ever. I don't think you should discount uh, instinct. And experience, you know, Andrew, Andrew's a great example. My, myself, you, you're talking about 60 years worth of, of sales experience. I don't think you should ignore it. And I think it, it has a role to play. I actually talk when I talk about forecasting and pipeline management, so sales control, it's a blend. You know, I want high quality data and I want, you know, um, sales ops people who've got access to this data and able to uh, interpret it and analyze it in a, in a useful way. But I also want to be able to have a human conversation with my salespeople and my customers and sort of weave that into a, a more reliable decision. But um, uh, I, I think, yes, I think this is a wonderful time for you, for your businesses to double down on the collection, um, uh, capture uh, and analysis of, of sales and marketing data. Um, I, I, I mentioned to you guys in, in my notes, I saw a really, really, I mean, I, I don't think I've seen this, I think I've seen this ever actually, but uh, a, a CRO coming back to, so we're, we're getting into business planning season, aren't we, for 2020, uh, 2023, and he, he, he came back, she came back, sorry, with a um, significantly reduced quota for next year. And I can remember as we're going to the board meeting, thinking, well, this is going to go well. Because it never goes well, you know. You 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 know, having that conversation with your investors about reducing the number for next year, but uh, and it was a material reduction, by the way. It was double digit. Um, actually, it it was relatively seamless. It was relatively painless getting the consensus that we needed because she had the data, she had the evidence, and it was laid out um, clearly and, and easily uh, easily explainable and um, and quite compelling. And I, and I thought she did a fabulous job, but. But because she'd done her prep, because she knew exactly what was going on in her base and in her market, ultimately the decision to reduce the, the targets for next year was, was signed off. Um, and I think that's really, really important because anyone can just, you know, give out aspiration targets that everybody's going to fail to hit. But the salespeople who earn, aren't earning compensation are a flight risk. Um, sales teams that aren't hitting targets are demotivated and confidence just seeps out the team. So uh, a really good example, a recent example of where data 
scientific data is actually being used to make um, uh, better quality decisions in, in, these, in these trying conditions. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, James. I think that's super insightful. Um, we're through our questions, or well, we're not, but um, I do want to um, uh, keep some time for the audience to ask, um, ask you any questions. So uh, James, I'm gonna encourage everybody on the call here. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to come off mute and, um, and shoot. James, I'm interested in your CRO example just now and reducing yeah. quota. Did she offer up a reduction in cost as well and a reduction in sales team and a reduction in marketing? I bet she didn't. Yeah, she, 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 I say she offered it up. Um, it's, it's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, in, in the sense that, um, well, two, two things have happened. One, if you've done a recruitment freeze, so it's a, it's a net, it's a net loss. So that the, the heads that she wanted to hire in certain areas last year will now not happen. But actually, uh, I, I'm going to give her credit here on the, I'm going to call it performance marketing side. Um, we we massively reduce sprint. Um, now I'm I'm not I'm not one of these uh, investors who simply says, look, in a downturn, let's cut training, let's cut IT, let's cut marketing because they're soft targets. Um, and there are plenty of examples of businesses that have done well in in downturns. I mean, examples that we all know, like WhatsApp and, and Uber and businesses that started in recession. So it can, absolutely can be done. I think, you know, any any. Um, any uh, any downturn will will also be an opportunity so i wouldn't i wouldn't be one of those people who would sort of in a binary way advocate just just reducing the spend on marketing but but what we did do is we focused um we've asked it to focus very specifically on those channels that only deliver um uh, uh revenue impact in a relatively short space of time so two two two, two examples so i'm not sure who answered the question so i can't answer you by name but um one was one was one was on PR and branding, um, something that I I personally believe in hugely, uh, is is a little bit more difficult to measure than say lead gen or demand gen clearly, yeah. and does have a longer term. Um, it takes a longer term longer time to to have an effect. So we've dialed that down, but we've also dialed down some of the performance marketing channels that just weren't weren't going to deliver in in a short space of time one other thing as well that that was really interesting was um in part of the presentation one of the one of the complicating factors that she was talking about in terms of reducing um uh the revenue number was that we weren't getting enough from our partners and when you think about it that makes perfect sense because when you go to your partner and say hey you know we're gonna focus on you selling our products next year and they're like are you mad I get I get thirty percent margin on your product. I get a hundred on mine or ninety on mine. I am going to focus on selling my products because guess what? We're also under pressure, and and you could see that partner channel actually is going to be um, perhaps less effective over over the coming years. So what we actually said was that we're not going to be recruiting the partner people that that she'd wanted. So um, you listen, you, 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 yes, half right. There were some offerings up on reductions, but we actually did fall through some others as well. So I, I think it has been the budget for next year has been right size. But hey, ask me that question in a year's time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I would be very much for pushing the right marketing, but I'm far happier to have, say, a dozen salespeople on 130, 140% of quota than 20, 22 salespeople on, you know, 60, 70% and demotivated. So, and then bring them in as demand is, is very clearly there. Yeah, yeah. Dif dif difficult to disagree. Any other questions from the audience? Just as a and, and a follow up to that one as well um, is I think the other thing um, and I think we did do it with this business, but I've been doing it a lot with other businesses as well. Is just running three three budgets. I think this is a really this is a. This is something that I learned in, in 2008, um, running, a, running a marketing technology business where RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, was our biggest customer. Um, for the Brits on the call, you'll know exactly how an absolute nightmare that was. Um, <laughs> but we we actually ended up running three budgets that, that year into 2008. So we had a, we had a worst case budget. Um, we had our budget, the, the budget that we planned to, and we had the sales stretch budget. Um, the sales stretch budget was what comp was paid on. The worst case budget was, 
you know, with a high attrition rate or high high churn rate, um, limited new business. I actually think that sort of range ranging, I think it's called, or whether it's range forecasting, range policy, that was incredibly useful because you, you had already to go plan A, plan B and plan C. Um, and different parts of the business were, were targeted in different ways. Um, and certainly the stretch budget was 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 super useful with the salespeople because um, we were, and, and again, I've seen quite a lot of, of research. I don't know what you guys are winning by design have seen this, but accelerators and kickers, achievable accelerators and kickers, I think are having quite a, a, a profound impact on salespeople. Um, so, you know, pay, paying up to 100% of target was, was relatively modest. But for those people who got up to target, or there was another one I remember where we were consistently delivering revenue quarter in, quarter out, quarter, and that was also highly rewarded because as investors, certainty is what we're after. So just being a little bit cuter around the way comp was paid, um, particularly when people got to milestones, uh, that also made a massive difference. But that was all around the stretch budget. The business was being run uh, on that on that second budget. And as I said, we had a plan B ready to go if, if situations worsened. And again, I think, I think as a, a sales leader, um, I think that's a really sensible contingency to have in place um, as we as we go forward into the 23. I really like that. It's a very thoughtful way of doing things. And um, uh, it also shows, again, the, the importance of um, of your data. Right. Uh, I think that's great. Great advice. Um, well, uh, James, um, unless there's anybody that, um, that that does have a question, I think that's it for today. So any questions for James before we part ways today? All right, James, um, thank you so much. I think this was extremely insightful. Um, for those who, uh, who joined, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'll be uh, um, sending over the recording of, uh, of the webinar um, later today. Feel free to share with, uh, with anybody that, uh, that you'd like. Um, and uh, unless uh, James, any final words or Rowe? Uh... So, um, you know, I, 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 I absolutely describe myself as a, a, a sales guy first and foremost, but the, the last, um, certainly the last 12 years, I, I, I guess I'm more on the investor side. I do appreciate there are some um, questions and, and conversation here that are not, are not possible in a, a public forum. I'm really easy to find uh, on LinkedIn or at the Frog Capital, the PSG website. Um, please, if you want to have a one-to-one -one conversation about some of the um, more delicate or nuanced parts of this, please don't hesitate. I'd be I'd be happy to uh, uh, happy to help in any way I can. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, James. Roy, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you everybody for joining. Thanks, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Have a great thank day. you. Thanks, Thanks.